Welcome to the Trust Us, We're Professionals podcast with your friends from SSC, CPAs, and advisors. This is the podcast where we break down financial matters found in pop culture and, you know, just kind of the national conversation, man. What we try to do here is make complex financial matters easier for our listeners to understand. I'm your host, Chris Underwood, a financial advisor with SSC Wealth. And today, I'm once again joined by Michelle Hammond and Chris Cohart, both legitimately like like wicked smart people, or at least our interns think so. Chris, Michelle, did we do some research this time, or are we just coasting on what we learned in college? I really enjoy this movie. So I watched it several times, and then a, a couple more times while I'm sitting here before we do this podcast. This is my favorite movie. <laughs> I mean, o- seriously. Overboard? Overboard. Well, Gone with the Wind is my actual favorite movie, but as it relates to financial movies, this one's so good. Okay. This one's that, so good. Was I'm that so because excited. Of, was that because of Ryan Gosling in this one? Absolutely. Yeah. And the guy from Succession's on there, too. I mean, Steve Carell. Like, God. Yeah, that's true. Just a great cast. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. <laughs> okay, so I should tell the people what we're going to be talking about. In today's episode, <laughs> with all the immediate attention of GameStop, Robin Hood, and shorting stocks... We thought it might be a good time to go talk about these incredibly complex financial products that are part of the cause of the volatility in the stock market. But like we mentioned, we are also, of course, going to talk about the Oscar winning movie, The Big Short, because it's got like lots of cute guys in it and stuff. It's got short (laughs) in the title. Chris, <laughs> Michelle. It's not sh- why I picked this. I, I know. It's just I like it. <laughs> uh, I'm just messing around. Okay. Seriously, though. Shorting stocks. Can you please, I know this is a really, really complex thing. They made a whole movie about it and it's still not enough time, but please do your best to try to explain that concept simply. This is a hard concept. I this mean, is. It- so um, I became a licensed financial advisor within the last few years. You have to pass the series seven, which is all about securities and securities law and these investments. And this was hard for me with 20 years experience and two other designations to really get my hands around how this is working and what it really looks like. So I thought it would be super great for me to get on a microphone and try to explain it to other people. (laughs) Seemed like a good call, right? Yeah. I'm not a licensed financial advisor and I'm not taking the series seven. I just have a lot of opinions. So I was qualified. (laughs) That's why you're allowed to be here. Yeah. So you're a blowhard? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Chris, Cohart, the blowhard. The blowhard. Yeah. Opinionated. So, okay. So a short is essentially um, a financial product that you are saying that you're going to risk money, that the underlying investment is going to go down, that what you're shorting today, the value that it's currently at is going to be less. Yeah. You're basically borrowing something and then hoping to buy it back after it drops in price and then repay what you did with the lesser value. Absolutely. So yes. you're, you believe that the underlying asset that you're buying will be worth less in a finite period of time. Yeah. And I think that's important what Chris had said, because it's a financial product, but what that person is doing mm-hmm. is I'm bar I'm telling Chris that I'm, I want to borrow your shares of GameStop because I, and then I'm going to immediately sell those shares at whatever price it currently is. And then I'm going to try to buy those back later because I'm sitting on cash, but I have to give it back to Chris at a certain time period. Those same, that same share of GameStop. So that doesn't sound confusing at all, Chris, right? It's incredibly confusing, but what they did in the big short isn't exactly what happened to the investors that lost billions on GameStop short sales, right? Different things. Different thing. Same concept, they believed the value of the underlying asset would go down. So they came up with a, do you want to do it, Chris? Right. So the protagonist in the movie, the, the four kind of main groups that they followed, they believed that the market, the mortgage market was going to go down. It was going to default. They, 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 really, st- they really paid attention to Michael uh, Burry, who, who's kind of the one that said that, hey, this isn't going to work. He went through all the numbers. He looked what was in the mortgage-backed securities and said, all these people are going to default and here's when it's going to be when the adjusted mortgage rates go up. So they believed that the market rates were going to go down. So they were betting against the market. They borrowed, they went to the banks and said, yeah, Hey, we want to buy these securities from you. And then they sold them. But what the difference being is that they didn't believe that the banks would be able to make good on their portion. So they created the, the, a new product, the credit default swaps 
that's the difference of what the difference between the GameStop and what these guys did at, in the movie The Big Short. Yeah, a credit default swap kind of protects um, an investor um, and protects the lender by buying something that's similar to an insurance policy. Okay? Very similar. Um, a credit default swap, when you do this, you pay a premium. Uh, it depends on the contract. These are contracts that mm -hmm. people are entering into, okay? So they enter into a contract and they say, okay, um, for this credit default swap, I will pay you $1,000 um, a month. I think it was costing five to six million a month yeah. in the uh, in in the big short for uh, Christian Bale. Who, yeah, who that, that was Michael play? Burry. That was Burry. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I just know the actors. Oh, look, it's Christian Bale. But so um, <laughs> I'm sure he takes that as a compliment. It's Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was more like, you know, that it's, it's an insurance policy um, because they believe um, that that the underlying asset is no good. Right. And they and they and at that point in time, he's not holding the assets anymore because he oh. sold the asset that he borrowed for, borrowed from the bank and then used the cash that he made from the sale to buy the insurance policies that doesn't have a market to it. So he didn't have any market gains. He was just having expenses out. He was just paying a five million dollar premium, hoping that we're well, not really hoping. I, I think he had that, a, he even more than hope on this. Yeah, I don't think he hope is probably more in a pot. He was betting, yeah, betting. that 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 the, it would fail, and so he would get pay out of the insurance premium from the insurance company, which then he could buy the stocks back, which then he could give back to the bank. Yes. So this is very morbid, but I'm a morbid guy. <laughs> but to illustrate a point. Michelle doesn't think that's funny. No, all right. So I'll get inside. This is very morbid, but to illustrate a point, it's kind of like buying a life insurance policy on someone that you think has a better chance of dying than another person. You had some inside knowledge. They went and they looked at the yeah. buildings. They were not, I mean, people who were living in the buildings were renting or living in the houses were renting the houses. They, they, they were talking to strippers um about how their first house had three mortgages on it and their second house they were able to get um at an adjustable rate mortgage that was going to balloon in three months and she had no idea what the payments were going to be she had no idea she had an adjustable rate mortgage they did the research to see that the underlying securities that were being sold were bunk so they had some ins they had they did their due diligence <laughs> before they found out uh before they were able to determine um, that this is probably not a sustainable, a sustainable in, uh, industry. So they determined, to use my analogy, one of them was in terribly poor health, a lifelong smoker, had cancer, <laughs> going down. <laughs> well, I, I think you to to kind of equate that, it might be that you're almost betting. So you're looking at two people, and like yeah. I'm betting that that person's going to die first. Yeah. And I'm bet you a thousand bucks that that person is going to die first. And I was like, yeah, I'll take that bet because that guy doesn't smoke. He runs 10 times a day. I don't know, 10 miles a day. And then that person was that person that took the bet is going to a different insurance company and saying, I'm going to secure this with that, with, with that bet. And which is why all of the banks that he went to were laughing at him behind his back. Well, in his face, even. in his face, in his sure. face, why he was going and saying, Hey, I, I'd like to do this deal with you. I'm, I'm betting against all of the, I'm betting against the American mortgage industry. Right. There were, there was multiple times throughout the movie. They're like, it's a mortgage. People pay their mortgage. Like, why duh. would you bet against that? Duh. And he's like, yes, I want to bet against that. Yeah. And I think that's why the, the mortgage companies all laughed at him because this was always one of the most secure investments that you could have. These these uh, mortgage-backed securities where they just bundled a bunch of mortgages and created a, a tradable asset because it creates income. There's mortgage payments that happen every month, every month. So I'm getting something in return, and I know it's going to be paid off. So like, yeah, deal. I'll take that anytime, any place. And there's an underlying asset, the house. Right. And how in the world would all of the housing market crash right. at once? Just not heard of. Well, it can. Cohort, can you give us another example? Definitely. This example is that I that I have, or I see that you have 500 shares of Coke. So Michelle has 500 shares of Coke. And I just go to Michelle and I say, hey, can I borrow your $500, 500 shares of Coca-Cola stock? Michelle, would you would you lend me your five hundred shares? Well, the price that day is fifty dollars a share, um, so that'd be twenty five thousand dollars worth of stock. 
So uh, I'm going to have to charge you interest on that, Chris. That's that's fine. Okay, uh, I'm going to charge you a grand, and I want them back by June 15th. Uh, that's a deal. I will take that deal. Okay. So then I'm I now... I don't own these shares per se. <laughs> Michelle still owns them. I'm just she just borrowed, lent them to me. So I turn around and sell those shares immediately. So I have twenty five thousand dollars worth of cash, and now I have between today, which is end of May or whenever we are, and I have until June fifteenth to see that price go down. My hope is that price is anything less than fifty. Hopefully it's way less than 50. So if on June 15th, that stock is $40 a share, perfect. I've now hit my number that I'm comfortable with. So I buy 500 shares of Coca-Cola stock at $40 a share, and it costs me $20,000. So I've now created some, some profit, and then I just give Michelle back her 500 shares plus $1,000 worth of interest, well, now I have a total cost of $21,000. My $20,000 for the 500 shares at $40 a share plus the $100 of $1,000 of interest that I promised to Michelle. So I just made a net profit of $40,000 or $4,000 on that share, on that sale, because the stock price went down. Now, if in that time period, the stock price went to $60 a share, I'm in trouble because I only have $25,000 to invest to buy this shop, this stock, and I can't buy 500 shares at $60 a share and, and still have cash left over. So I have to come up with additional money. So if I want to give Michelle back her 500 shares plus $1,000, I've got to come up with $31,000 somehow. I've got 25, but I've got to come up with another six. So that short deal that I just made just cost me $6,000. Confusing? Yeah, and I think this is important for everyone listening at home from like an investment standpoint, the gain is defined. You can only gain so much by this practice, but there is potential for unlimited losses. Cohort with your Coca-Cola analogy. What if it went way beyond 60? What if it went to a thousand dollars? I would be in real trouble. I would be in real trouble because I would have to come up with, uh, what is that? Half a million dollars to buy those 500 shares then I've been in real trouble because I'm going to have to come up with a half a million dollars worth of cash to well, $475,000 worth of cash to buy those 500 shares. Don't forget about my interest <laughs> and, and her interest. <laughs> yes. So $476,000 I have to find to pay Michelle back for those shares. Yeah, an unprotected short has an unlimited loss situation. Right. Okay. Um, when you're, when you're just investing in a company, right? You just buy the shares of Coca-Cola, you hold it forever. Your exposure on Coca-Cola is whatever you paid for Coca-Cola. And so that's being long or having a long-term investment horizon for that stock. Right. In my, in my short position, like Chris said, has a defined gain. Like I, stock can't go any lower than zero. <laughs> right. So at some point, Michelle, if it's a penny, I'm going to buy them back for a penny and I'm, and I'm going to make $50 here. I'm going to make 24,000 cause I still got to give her a thousand dollars of interest back, interest. <laughs> but I have a defined gain that I can have. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk some about GameStop. We haven't gotten to that yet. For those of you that don't know, and that dates everyone in the room, if anyone doesn't know about this. <laughs> GameStop is an American chain of traditional brick and mortar video game stores. Back in the olden days, you could trade in a video you bought for 80 bucks, video, a game you bought for 80 bucks and get a $2 credit towards a new game. But these days with everything online and digital, they've really struggled, okay? Throwing the economic effects of COVID-19 and GameStop looked like it was about to go down for the dirt nap. As a result, GameStop's stock price declined, leading many institutional investors to short sell the stock. Yep, investors looked around, institutional investors looked around and said, you know what, the, the outlook for GameStop is terrible. So let's start shorting this thing. And at, on January 22nd, 
140% of the stock available at GameStop had been shorted. Wait a minute, that's more than 100. 140% of the stock at GameStop had been shorted. So people didn't just short the first set of stock they had, they put a short on a short. And that's only happened 15 times in 10 years prior to this, okay? So people were reeled down on our buddies at, at GameStop, even though I think that the model of screwing uh, young teenagers out of their hard-earned money for video games is sustainable. Um, okay. So doing just fine. Doing just fine. So then what happens, right? The stock does not go down. It goes up. It goes up in that scenario that we just talked about into a range of what I would consider to be unlimited. <laughs> I don't remember how high it got. I mean, ridiculous, right? All these short sellers are looking around going, oh, sh right? I got to buy this back. And now it's at a rate that is just unsustainable and this unlimited loss situation that we were just describing. Um, Melvin Capital, um, they were huge. They, they shorted GameStop big. And these exact numbers are not here. They do their value of their funds at the beginning, at the end of quarters. And they lost 30% of their value since the start of 2021. Um, they're thinking that that's probably, they went from 12 and a half billion to 8 billion. They had other gains and they had capital invested. I don't know what they lost on GameStop, but it was a lot. And can we talk about Robinhood and the role that they played with GameStop? It was basically just a lot of, I don't want to say novices, but just whatever, non-professionals who propped up, probably had an affinity for video games, kind of somewhat coordinated online and basically propped up the value of GameStop. Is that basically accurate? I don't think it was Robin Hood per se. I mean, the Robin Hood has created a lot, a, quite a few more retail investors in the market. Sure, it, it, that was just a platform, but yeah. it's no, no fees and stuff like that. So it's appealing to the, you know, the new person coming into it. Right, Robin is probably the most popular no fee, new retail app that you can get that a lot of invest, a lot of retail, new and retail investors um, are using. And they actually stopped trading GameStop and AMC at a certain point in time. Um, so I, they tried to kind of put a kibosh on that, but it, it was, yeah, it was kind of somewhat of a coordinated effort. I'd, I'd hate to say coordinated because that that's illegal, right? I don't think you can coordinate. A, a, a consistent effort. <laughs> <laughs> there was some chat room stuff and there was some like discussion. They weren't just like, it wasn't just random that all these people decided to do this with GameStop. Yeah, they, they believed that they were, weren't being fairly treated and that and the institutional investors were, were giving some special treatments. And so they wanted to stick it to the, the short sellers, the institutional investors. These and, short positions are public, right, Chris? Yeah. Okay. So they could see this, the institutional investors. It's on your phone, right? It's on my phone, yeah. You can tell what short it. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. He's not on Robinhood, I don't know. No, think. I use Weeble. See, there we go. But but I think what's also important with like the, the Melvin Capital and all these uh, investment funds is you know, they have to cover their short positions. And so they tend, when, when it starts driving it up like the GameStop st stock did, they started buying stock the game stock stock to cover their positions, which actually kind of has the opposite effect that you keep buying the stock, which drives the stock price up. So they're buying it at a higher pr price to try to get those gains to cover their short position later. So it kind of creates this monster that they that somebody else started, but they're now trying to, to, to cover their positions to make sure that they don't have the unlimited loss potential that they now are facing themselves with. Andrew left at Citron. He's a big short seller. And this made him um, even step back and look at the market in a different way and say, short selling probably isn't the right way forward for our funds and the research and the things that we do. And that he'll continue to move more on the long side of things, which is that long horizon, long term holding, investing for value and investing for growth, which is what I thought the market was doing the whole time anyway. So I was a little surprised. <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think in, in my view, because I'm a relatively new, new to the market, new retail investor to the market. I've always watched it, but I've never participated in it as much as I have in the last two years. Um, I've always viewed it as that kind of that, the the grand idea that we're all trying to row the same boat forward and we're all in a long position um, in all these stocks. But there is a lot of short sellers out there and you see these short reports and they have to disclose, hey, I'm a short seller on this. And they're giving you all the downsides of, of what this or this organization does well and doesn't do well. 
and trying to drive that price down to, to cover their short position. And I think Citron was one of the bigger ones. So it, it's mm-hmm. interesting to see that them changing their model and going more for that long position. Well, and just shows that, I mean, we're not all rowing in the same direction. You right. know, there's some people that are rowing in the opposite direction and hope that, you know, your boat crashes, you know, that kind of thing. It's, I mean, it sounds simplistic, but if someone's losing money, someone else is making money. Well, yes, yeah, people did okay on the old GameStop fiasco. Don't worry about them. No, I don't. <laughs> don't worry about them. They have plenty of money to buy video games. They, they have plenty of money. They had the stock. They had the GameStop stock. GameStop GameStop stock. Whew. That is so hard. This is so hard. <laughs> they had the stock that other people needed to cover their short, yeah. their short sale, and they sold it. And they sold it at those high amounts, and they made really good money. Um, let's see. Um, I, I think the the one thing that tends to be somewhat forgotten in these is some some of the individuals that are participating in this may not be as informed investors as others. So they see a stock that's going up and that in a way that GameStop was, GameStop was, and they want to participate in that. And so they're buying the stock thinking that it's only going to go up or they want to be part of this, this crazy mania that is related to this. And they, they don't have the capacity to, to sell that or, or get out. Or maybe they were part of Robinhood. Robinhood stopped allowing the trading of that stock. And then once that price dipped later on, they were kind of stuck. They were kind of stuck. I think there's also a takeaway here of, I mean, when especially when it comes to money, I mean, don't, unless you know what you're doing, be careful. You know what I mean? Like, it, it sounds like it's all fun and games, but if you don't understand, bad things can happen, you know? Right. So just be really careful with what you're doing to make sure you understand exactly what you're doing. Right. And Michelle, you, you had researched some people that had made a pretty significant amount of money from That's games. That's just, just looking at all those. Um, BlackRock. Um, they had the 13% stake in GameStop, worth $2.6 billion at the peak. And they sold it. Made uh, Murdoch Capital sold theirs. $200 million. That's what they made um, on, on their um, AMC and GameStop stock. Yeah, not a bad deal. Morgan Stanley didn't do too bad. 30% increase. Even the Mormons turned out well um, through their investment manager. Um, they had 46,000 shares of GameStop and saw its investment value jump by, jump by 900%. So um, it just depends on where you are at the time when, when things are changing and the volatility in the market either favors you or it doesn't. Right. Yep. And what I thought was really interesting is that influencers, do we call them influencers? Uh, I mean, they're, I mean, who are we talking about? I'll tell you. <laughs> Kim Kardashian, no, like Elon Musk, Mark Cuban. They're talking about GameStop. They're telling people what to do. They're saying, stay in, get out. Game songs, was, isn't that what Musk said? Yeah, and it feels like they're manipulating the market to a certain degree. It's just to the extent that people want to listen to them. Yeah. yeah I, don't, know? I don't think they, they're probably the definition of an influencer. I think there are influencers on social platforms now. That's their job. But I think yes. that they definitely... In, they have the ear and are able to influence the general population because their tr- their view is trusted wise business people or, or investors the you know the Mark Cubans the like you said uh, Elon Musk of the world uh, you know maybe even a, a Dave Portnoy at, at uh, Barstool Sports who's who's kind of gotten into the trading as well those are viewed as very trusted big broad um, followings that maybe they're not set out to be influencers but I think they definitely have the capacity to influence a market, especially yeah, someone as, as rich as Mark Cuban to say, don't sell your stock. That means a lot. There's whole television shows um, dedicated. There's not shows. There's whole networks designated, dedicated to telling people what to do with their stocks. Right. Right. Telling buy, sell, don't hold here. Ask me a question. You know, it's 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 drama. It's daytime TV. You know, But when Musk says they're not going to accept, you know, cryptocurrency for Tesla after he said initially that they would and it drove up the price and he came back and said later on that they wouldn't. And it drove the price down of cryptocurrency. That feels like, I mean, almost like too powerful of a platform, because if you if you wanted to be nefarious and just say something to drive down the price, buy it there, and then say something else to drive it up and sell it. I mean, you could do that. Yeah, I, I think the, the difference would, I think you'd have to, sh- we'd have to be able to prove intent. 
a, you can see that you bought stock or bought cryptocurrency prior to at a certain price prior to your your post, your tweet, whatever the case might be. Maybe you bought a short position. Maybe we go <laughs> do exactly what they were doing in, in the big short and buying a short position, expecting the price to go down, going out and, and influencing the general population in a way that he did. And then an immediate sale at a certain price of, of that currency or that stock or whatever the case might be. I, I think in that situation, we would they would probably have some troubles, but I think... Well, people have had troubles. Yeah. Um, there's people on CNBC who would buy this, this is a long time ago, would right. buy the stock, then go on their show and say, you guys should buy the stock too, and then turn around and sell the stock. That's illegal. You know, they right. got in trouble, right? right. So there is a, there is rules surrounding it. This just feels weirder. It feels faster. It feels more intense. And it feels like a lot more information that is coming at people and that people are using what Elon um, invests in and what he says um, to to decide what's right for their investment strategies is, is kind of out there for me. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, not condemning the man. It just, it feels like just a lot of power for one person, right? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't disagree. I, I think social media has created, I, I think even during, um, from a political perspective, I, I think that there, there it does create a, a pretty powerful tool in us finding kind of that balance from investing to politics to, 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 to sports of how we how we balance the information we're getting in these platforms and and what's truly a trusted source of, of information so tune in next week when we dive into social media <laughs> how about not <laughs> okay well in closing we gotta get out of here you all have been very patient listeners for a very complex subject you know what is the takeaway here you know to you know the general public small business owner you know People that, you know, still hopefully you understand it a little bit better, but probably not. But hopefully you do about short selling and just some of this, you know, craziness and the volatility related to the market. There are a lot of complex financial products out there that may not fit your risk profile and the things that you have intended um, for your financial future. You know, um, we recommend creating a plan, um, uh, setting out your path for your investments, diversification and the strategy surrounding that and following the plan and not listening to the noise, you know, um, make a plan and stick to it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think when it comes to finances, having trusted advisors, having quality information, having quality plans is what's going to really make you successful. There, there will always be manias like we saw with GameStop, GameStop and AMC. Yeah. We're still seeing them. Yeah. But sticking with the plan that you have, that you've set out, that, that you know works for your long-term financial needs, that, that's what makes you successful, for sure. Creating a diverse portfolio that accomplishes your long-term goals. At SSC Wealth, we do not short. So, <laughs> so if you only have one takeaway, we don't short, we don't mess with it. That's not what we do. That's it for today's episode of the Trust Us, We're Professionals podcast brought to you by all of us at SSC, CPAs, and Advisors. If you ever have any financial questions or concerns, please reach out. You can reach out through our website, www.ssccpas.com. Once again, that's www.ssccpas.com. You can also email the show, please do, podcast at ssccpas.com. Cohort, Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Underwood. It was exciting. Thank you. You're giddy. I'm giddy. giddy. This podcast was recorded and is being made available by SSC Solutions Inc. Together with its affiliates and its employees, SSC is solely for informational purposes. SSC is not providing or undertaking to provide any financial, economic, legal, accounting, tax, or any other advice in or by virtue of this podcast. The information, statements, comments, views, and opinions provided in this podcast are general in nature, and such information, statements, comments, views, and opinions in the receipt of this podcast by any listener are not intended to be and should not be construed as the provision of investment advice by SSC. That listener or generally and do not result in any listener being considered a client or customer of SSC. The information, statements, comments, views, and opinions expressed in this podcast do not constitute and should not be construed as and offer to buy or sell any securities or to make any investment course of action. The information, statements, comments, views, and opinions expressed or provided in this podcast, including by speakers who are not officers, employees, or agents of SSC, are not necessarily those of SSC and may not be current. SSC does not make any representation or warranty as to the accuracy or completeness of any of the information, statements, comments, views, or opinions contained in this podcast. Any liability thereof, including in respect of direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage of any kind whatsoever, is expressly disclaimed. SSC does not undertake any obligation whatsoever to provide any form of update, amendment, change, or correction to any of this information, statements, comments, 
views or opinions set forth in this podcast. No part of this podcast may, without SSC Solutions, Inc.'s prior written consent, be reproduced, redistributed, published, copied, or duplicated in any form by any means.